of a challenge for poor brother Bobby, <laughs> who I've been tormenting by moving around the room so much in the last few days, which is really hard for the camera persons. Um, Lily, do you want to put it, just put it down here? So, yesterday we did some walking meditation after lunch. Because remember, we were in the, the danger zone of perhaps potentially falling asleep in our practice. And so today I thought we'd have a different kind of danger zone. I thought we'd walk into the ethical minefield and explore a little bit about sila. So everyone knows what I mean when I use the word sila, right? Yeah. So we might use the word to translate it such as ethical conduct or ethics. Some people translate it as virtue or morality. Does anyone not know what the five precepts are? Has everyone heard about the five precepts? Yeah? Any, anyone at all who hasn't? No idea, isn't sure? Good. Great. So we'll kind of explain them as we go. Um, and for this activity, I think it's actually really important to have consent um, for filming. Is everyone comfortable being filmed? Yeah? You don't even know what you're doing yet. <laughs> Is it ethical for me to ask that before you <laughs> to get your agreement before you know what you're doing? Okay, so I'd also like to make sure that everyone here understands that this is going to be a judgment-free zone, right? No judgments of ourselves and other people. So I'm going to be asking some tough questions. And what's most important is that we actually be honest, not that you try to impress me or others by lying. <laughs> that wouldn't be very ethical. <laughs> so we're going to be exploring some aspect of ethics. And so we're going to do this work now in the hope that we can connect it somehow to the theme of joy. <laughs> So it might be a bit of a leap, um, might seem like a bit of a leap at first, but we'll see if we can make that connection somehow later on. So this is strongly agree, strongly agree. This is agree. This is neutral. This is, what is this going to be? Disagree. And this is strongly disagree. So we better start out in the middle, right? In the neutral zone. Otherwise, you're agreeing or disagreeing. You don't even know what you're disagreeing or agreeing to. Okay, very good. Everyone's looking very neutral. So, ethics are an important part of Buddhism. Yeah, very good. Okay. Okay, good. I always keep the precepts. Agree? Strongly agree? Oh. <laughs> Strongly agree, yeah. Disagree, okay. We'll, we'll fill you in as we go for that. There's, there's one person in the room who isn't sure about what the precepts are. 
And so I'm just going to kind of drop them in as we go along. Yeah. Okay, so keeping precepts is easy. This is our walking meditation time, <laughs> you see. Yeah, not sure. Indifferent. Okay. Killing is bad. So that's the first precept, the precept against taking life. Killing cockroaches is okay. <laughs> Strongly agree. <laughs> oh, some very nervous laughter. Oh dear, okay. Strongly disagree. Oh, sorry, disagree. Bonte, of course, being a model for us all. Um, ending someone's life out of compassion is okay. Strongly agree, strongly disagree, disagree, agree. Agree. Don't agree? Disagree? Unsure in, in, in the middle, yeah. Neutral or unsure, yeah. So it's a pretty even spread, isn't it, across the room? Um, let's see. Killing in self defense is okay. Killing in self defense is okay. Most people are neutral, right? Okay. Uh, this might, I, th I can see a pattern emerging here. <laughs> I'm going to try to be in the middle path. <laughs> so, killing one person to save ten people is a good idea. Killing one person to save ten people is a good idea. Killing one person to save you is a good idea. <laughs> Honesty, is, yeah, not sure, yeah. Killing one person to save a member of your family is a good idea. Yeah, you've got your family here, you have to go there, don't you? <laughs> okay, so it's complicated, right? Ethics? It's not simple at all. What about the second precept? second precept is about stealing, that we're not allowed to take what is not given. Sometimes stealing is okay. Agree or disagree? Sometimes stealing is okay. Taking from the rich to give to the poor is okay. <laughs> yes, there's a radical in the room. Okay, very good. So this is strongly... Disagree. Okay, just making sure. Um, stealing food when you are starving is okay. S 
stealing clothes from a ghost is okay. Stealing clothes from a ghost is okay. <laughs> this is actually in the Vinaya. <laughs> so apparently it's okay to steal from a ghost because they can't own anything. What about stealing from a cat? If you steal a cat's toy, is it okay? Strongly agreeing. So again, in the Vinaya for monks, it's not an offence to take something from an animal without permission. What about stealing a cat? <laughs> yeah, you've got to go to strongly. Yeah, very good. Okay. What about... Sometimes I have taken things without permission. Sometimes I have taken things without permission. Yeah. So, lucky it's a non judgment zone, right? Yeah. Okay, so it's not very clear either, is it? You know, it's hard to know sometimes why we take things or why others might take things. It's difficult to judge. Last one. Downloading. <laughs> Dharma books that are copyrighted is okay. Oh, it's difficult to know, isn't it, that one? See the middle path taking off here? <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to give you any answers on that one. But we can move to the next precept. What is the next precept? Sexual misconduct. Okay, so having an affair is okay. So you can all just, just so you know, I can just reassure you, I'm not going to ask if anyone here is having an affair or has having an affair, so you can relax, okay? Having more than one wife is okay. Uh, sorry, forgive me, sorry. What, more than one partner, yeah. More than one partner. Which would you like to go with today? Buddhist perspective. Uh, yes, a romantic partner. Yeah. Yep. That's true. Yeah. So you tell me what you think. Ah, oh, very good. You should middle somewhere. Yeah. That's right. So, of course, we know that at the time of the Buddha, multiple marriage, as in usually a man, could have several wives. And some of the bhikkhunis uh, in the Tarigatha, we hear about bhikkhunis who were um, co-wives. Sometimes mother and daughter were co-wives, right? Yeah. And in many Buddhist cultures, such as Tibetan Buddhist culture and, and parts of Nepal and other Himalaya areas, it's quite common for groups to practice polyandry, having two husbands, twice the amount of trouble. <laughs> so, open relationships are okay. Um, 
relationships with people under 20 are okay? It's a trick question, yeah. <laughs> Is it okay? Under 20. Well, that's right. Sorry, I haven't had enough coffee today. Yeah. I guess I'm talking about you personally. Yeah. Yeah. So let's imagine that you are in a relationship and this person is not married. Under 20, yeah. And now you are not in a relationship. You are not married. Is it okay to have a relationship with someone who's 20? Too old, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't phrase it correctly. I should, have, I should have thought that through. Okay, very good. Okay, now some more difficult ones. Masturbation is okay. Masturbation is not sexual misconduct. Okay. Uh, being gay is sexual misconduct. Being queer is sexual misconduct. Strongly disagree, strongly agree. Strongly disagree, strongly agree. Yes, that's right. Very good. Yes, it's not sexual misconduct at all. So this is um, a little bit about the third precept. Fourth precept is, what is the fourth precept? Yes, okay. Lying to your parents about their medical diagnosis, which is bad, is okay to do. If they have a medical diagnosis which is not good for them, it's okay. Ah, yes, it's difficult to say, isn't it? Most people are in the middle again. Telling your children a lie to protect them is okay. Strongly agree, strongly disagree. Using a pseudonym on the internet is okay when you're posting and commenting and things like that? Using a pseudonym, an avatar, a fake name. Is it okay? Strongly agree, strongly disagree. Right, okay, no, okay, good. Um, What's another good one for, for wrong speech? Um, oh, of course. Thank you. Telling little lies is okay. Just little ones. Harmless lies. Like, I'll see you at 2 o'clock knowing that you're not going to go. Agree. Neutral. Disagree, strongly disagree. Okay. Breaking a promise, but not meaning to. Breaking a promise, but not meaning to. Agree, disagree. Breaking a promise, but not meaning to is wrong speech. Sorry, I should say the whole thing. Yeah. Disagree. Okay, good. Um, what about the last precept? Number five. 
อัลกอฮอล์ drinking drugs intoxicants taking alcohol is okay in Buddhism disagree or agree Disagree, strongly disagree. Oh, no one's there. Okay, it's very interesting. And again, no judgment. Sometimes I drink alcohol. Very good. Okay, very good. Thank you for being honest. Because you don't want to lie. We just talked about lying, right? Yes. Oh, that was my next question. <laughs> okay, wait, 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 wait. We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay, so we're pretty divided, right? Yeah. So, using alcohol for cooking is okay. Drinking just a little bit <laughs> is okay. Some people are getting a good workout today, right? Yeah. Smoking marijuana is not against the precepts. Smoking marijuana is not against the precepts. Agree or disagree? <laughs> Smoking marijuana is not against the precepts. I'm trying to use language a bit creatively here to confuse. <laughs> Using medical marijuana that is legal as pain relief is not against the precepts. Addictive medicines, such as opioids, are not against the precepts. Agree, disagree. Yeah. Using magic mushrooms. Do you know what magic mushrooms are? Ah, hallucinogenic mushrooms. So they've they've started to do all these studies. They've started to do all these studies that show that taking um, magic mushrooms can cure depression. Taking magic mushrooms is it against the precepts? Agree, disagree for to cure depression. Is it against the precepts? To cure depression? Not against the precepts. Okay. So, that's the end of our ethical minefield game. Should we take a seat? We'll sit in a circle. Yeah, grab, grab a cushion or something to sit on.
Yeah, I'm gonna, I might just fold it in half. Oh, should we fold it in half? Just fold them, just fold them in half. And I'll put everyone. I'll just use half. Then. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so I've counted how many pens are here. Just in case anyone steals the office stationery. <laughs> so what did we just learn about precepts and ethics? Is that true? Everyone has their own opinions? Yeah, if we can, yeah, they can tear it in half. Yeah, we can do that. It can be our our chore. So is it true that there's no right and wrong? It depends. Yeah. On what? Situation? How you feel about it? <laughs> Maybe. Your intention. Right. Are oh, there some more here? Yep. Do you want to hand these out? So, one thing about the precepts is that these are not commandments, right? These are not thou shalt not. And we've only got five. Only five precepts that we keep most of the time, right? And even then, maybe some people only keep only keep um, maybe four. It's quite common, actually, for Buddhists to drink. Did you know that? I often go, I don't know if you do this, Bhante, but you go into house dhanas sometimes, into people's homes, and so you'll be sitting there, and, they'll, and people will be sitting in front of you. And sometimes behind you, there's like this liquor cabinet. <laughs> and then they'll ask for the precepts. And then you kind of see this flicker of recognition by the time they get to the fifth precept. And they're like, oh, oh. <laughs> and then other times I've been in a house where, where people have been taking the precepts and we're going, we, we offered dana and things like that. And halfway through, someone has realize that the liquor, the liquor trolley is out in display and so casually kind of drapes a tablecloth over it as if it's gone, <laughs> you know. And of course, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't judge people for their conduct. We're not going around being the police. Uh, we don't knock on people's doors and ask them, are you following these precepts? Because this is not a, a, a legal thing for us. It's not even a compulsory part of being on the spiritual path. The precepts are training rules. So they're there to help us develop our mind. And they are the bare minimum of ethical conduct that the Buddha outlined. So for the monks and nuns, we have many, many more precepts. And some of these have nothing to do with morality or ethics. Some of these are just purely uh, legalistic and sometimes they're influenced by things like culture. Sometimes they're just about health and safety. But sometimes people wish that they had some stronger, clearer guidelines about every single situation 
that they come up against in life. They wish that they had something really clear for all of those areas of our life that don't seem to be covered by the precepts. So we're left a little bit up to our own individual interpretations sometimes. We might have a compassionate intention that might influence our action, even if we do something like kill a creature. Does that change that action, that compassionate intention? i never forget, I was in the monastery once and someone ran over this poor lizard and in the car and then was like really freaking out, didn't know what to do and he just took a spade and whacked it over the head because it was still alive. What do you think? Was that the right thing to do? It was a bit squished, it had been run over, suffering. What do you think? You think it's okay? Who says no, not okay? Yeah. Liz is suffering, yeah. What about the person afterwards? Then Meta? So these are the kind of issues that we face in real life, right? Like ethics are really easy and clear and simple on paper. And then when it comes to living our life, things can become a little complicated, right? So I want to know from you, what is the number one ethical dilemma facing you as a Buddhist? What is your number one ethical dilemma? Is it downloading Dharma books illegally? Is it those sweet little cockroaches? And whatever you write down, it's going to be anonymous. So you don't have to worry about people judging you or anything like that. So I'm just interested, what, what is an ethical challenge that you've faced as a Buddhist? Something that has been difficult for you to reconcile with the precepts, such as our open relationships, okay? Such as just how cooked does that wine need to be? <laughs> Yes. What do you mean by open? So an open relationship is a, a relationship where two people have consented to allowing other partners in their um, marriage or their their relationship. Yeah. So it's when they've both agreed to see other people. So it's an open relationship. Okay. So, what ethical dilemmas have you faced? Yes. The ethical dilemmas that we find uh, things that are hard to follow or Yes, if you want. Yeah. Something that's hard for you to follow. Um, I really enjoy lying and I lie all day every day. <laughs> you know, maybe it's something like that. Or in my work, I'm forced to lie about a product safety. Or um, sometimes I lie in my resume. Oh, that would have been a good one. For our, it's okay to lie in your resume. Strongly agree, strongly disagree. Um, what about things like in the workplace? Oh, so many ethical dilemmas, like perhaps having to pay a bribe to get a job done. Or... that you broke the photocopier and didn't admit it. Something practical, something that's a real issue for you. And write it so that someone else reading it would understand.
just use yeah, uh, um, do you want another piece of paper <laughs> one one is enough but if you want to if you want to write a couple then feel free yeah yeah but one is enough bigger subject than we can do today. So okay, one thing. So what are we gonna do next do you think? Five groups of four people. I think I got them. So maybe it's good to work with someone you haven't worked with before and maybe who's not a member of your family. And keep passing along, passing along, passing along. And you're going to discuss the ethical dilemmas as a group. So we have, we have 30 minutes, no, yeah, we have 30 minutes for this activity, 30 minutes. The instructions is to just talk about these ethical dilemmas. So you have, 
Five minutes each ethical dilemma. Okay, here's a one. There's twos. Three over there. Four over there. So you can go in the other room. So if you're a bit closer there, the group moves so that you don't have to listen to each other so much. So we're just talking about these ethical dilemmas. We're not trying to come up with anything definitive. We're not writing a, um, an academic study or a religious text. We're just talking about these ethical dilemmas. Chairs are at the back. You just use a chair and come and join the circle so that we don't feel that we've got like um, people being left out. Yeah, it's nice to. And feel free to, if anyone needs to sit on a chair, you're always really welcome to use a chair. How was that activity? It was fun. Ah, oh, well, that's... Uh, <laughs> Buddhists sometimes have a strange idea of fun, I guess. <laughs> what did you learn from that activity? It's complicated, right? Yeah. So I asked a few of you, a few of the groups, to maybe pick one and to present to the group about what they found. Does, is anyone ready to, to give it a quick chat? Everyone's <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> okay, what's that down here? Okay, thank you everyone. So I'm from group one. Um, I think firstly, we took some time to try to understand this a little bit because it's written as follows. Being truthful takes precedence over being beneficial? Question mark. If it is beneficial but not truthful, does one say it or not? So I think at first we weren't very sure exactly what kind of... Um, case it was, um, but in my mind, one of the examples could be if, let's say, a teacher knew that someone was not doing well in his or her studies, so I know that this person's not doing well, do I tell that person maybe a white lie and say that, hey, you're actually doing well, you know, keep at it, or should I not? Uh, say that. I think because we didn't have an example, uh, our team thought that it really depended on the case. And even in the case that I mentioned, um, telling a white lie might not be the most beneficial way forward because it's only maybe that person's perspective of what could be beneficial or useful. That white lie might actually also hurt the person. Further, right? Because he, has, he, gets, he or she gets a wrong perspective. So, yeah, I, I think uh, we decided that for this point, it really depends on the case-to-case -case basis. Ultimately, it, the action, if it's done with compassion, uh, I think that should be the guiding principle forward. Yeah, I see there are four uh, issues here, but I just pick one. This is uh, written as hard to avoid killing ants. <laughs> ants. Huh? So our group uh, would definitely find it very difficult to answer this, and uh, there are so many ifs and buts and conditions and so on and so forth. So I came up with this idea. It's best to ask monks how they avoid killing ants in the monastery. <laughs> Do you want to answer that, Venerable? <laughs> so, so actually, 
monasteries are often built with this very consideration in mind. And that's something that really impressed me was that the problem of killing creatures, such as ants, is sometimes just a question of architecture. Yeah. For example, at Wat Pa Nana Chach, you know Wat Pa Nana Chach in Thailand? It's a famous forest monastery, plagued with red ants, fire ants, and also like tiny, 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 tiny little ones. You know those little ones? that just seemed to be everywhere. And so when they had to rebuild a, I think it was the, the sewing room, they put in at the foundation level a thin trench that gets filled with water so that the ants can't cross. Unless, of course, a twig falls and they've got a handy bridge. And so that really impressed me because it's like, oh, yeah, that's like if we built buildings with consideration to not killing and thought a bit more about pest protection, then perhaps our buildings would look completely different. And um, the same goes for termites. So. Many of you will have seen in uh, some monasteries, they'll have the found, actually probably in a lot of houses in countries where there's a lot of termites, they have the foundations and then they'll have a little cap, like a metal cap or something over the top so that the, the termites can't go up. And think about so many other considerations like you know having fly screens or... Um, I was at a temple in Thailand recently where they had uh, protective enclosed balconies because of certain creatures coming in like peacocks and um, those kind of big creatures. So not that they could kill the peacocks, but they had just worked out a way to coexist with these creatures, you know, even if they had to have you know, screens on their balconies. And I think most monastics, we just kind of work around the problem. So I remember in Thailand, I had a hut where there was a constant convo con conga line of ants that just went along my skirting board around the edge of my room. And they never really bothered me. We just reached this truce where we were like, OK, if you stay over there, don't bother me. I'm not going to bother you. And we just coexisted. I remember one monk came in and he was like, what's going on here? And I'm like, oh, they just live there, you know, they're just doing their own thing. Um, but then they started to become obsessed with my toilet because there's some water there, right? And what do you do? There's only so long you can go without leaving it to flush, right? And then it's like, what are, are you intending to kill them if you flush? Or are you intending to flush? So it becomes, becomes very difficult sometimes to just go about your daily activities. Some people before were asking about the chanting that you can do to protect yourself from little creatures. So it's called the Kanda Parita. And the Kanda Parita is where the Buddha taught some words for the monks who are in the forest and they were beset by slithering creatures. And so these... Um, these few lines start to pay homage to the various kings of the serpent world, the snake kings, and then go on to give love to the, um, the no-footed, like creatures with no feet, like snakes and things like that, the, the two-footed, the four-footed, and the many-footed, and so it's, it's all about love. May I have love? May I have love for these, these creatures? Because what comes up when we encounter ants or cockroaches or whatever is the opposite of love, right? We have ill will. And that's what we're trying to overcome with our, our practice of precepts, right? The, the 
ill will, the aversion, the hatred. But anyway, we'll talk about that in a second. Who is the next group? Another group? Just, we'll just have one more to share and then we'll finish. Is there another group who wanted to say something? Yep. Um, okay, um, my big boss at work says I should omit um, what to say, yeah. I oh, okay, it's basically um not to do the proper testing before letting a product out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that you can catch the market in time. Um Our group uh, unanimously said that to resign and get another job. But then uh, uh, I, I had a question because I went through the same thing. Um, if it's our bread and butter, then uh, what do we do? Um, yeah, because time is hard now. It does not. It, it's not guaranteed that if you resign, you would get another job. So it's quite a sticky. Uh, position. Yeah. We hope for Mondays at Y Sundays. <laughs> because, because for me, I gave up my job, but I had to, we have to spend wisely after that. Mm. So I was also in that position. Do I give it up so that I can walk the spiritual path? better or do I continue because it's for survival sake yeah all, all of them said to resign <laughs> yeah yeah Should you, would you, maybe would you, not rather should, right? Would you, would you resign? Yes, hands up. Would you stay in the job? Depends. Yeah. So this is the complexity of ethical, spiritual practice. And so many people actually are faced with these same dilemmas. Actually, these come up again and again. It was funny, as I was walking around the group, I just hear ants, 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 ants. <laughs> so these things come up a lot, right? And sometimes um, we have to make these decisions. So example with a mo for example, with a monastery, if you have a cockroach outbreak in the kitchen, this is a public problem. The health department could shut the monastery down. So is it okay to deal with, deal with those cockroaches so that the monastery can keep going? Or should we just that the cockroaches take over and have no one allowed to come to the monastery. Give it to them. <laughs> so it's difficult. And we'll have to make these choices. The thing is, we'll have to live with these choices. And we'll have to live with staying as well in a job where we have an ethical dilemma. But the thing that I really want us to take away from today is that this is not theory. Our spiritual practice is not theoretical. Our ethical practice is not just theory, is it? This is, these kind of dilemmas, is where our ethical practice needs to show up. Our spiritual practice needs to show up, right? 
So you know that I, I, the last few years I was living with Bhante Sujato at the monastery at the end of the world. So Bhante Sujato bit of a um, apocalyptic doomsday <laughs> kind of, I want to say cult leader, but it's not quite right. So, so we, when we set this monastery up, we really wanted to have a focus on um, climate catastrophe, you know, the end of the world, the end of the world is coming, you know, and and so Bhante, he really concentrated on, the, you know, the science and all the data and things like that because it's the kind of thing that he likes. For me, I'm like, how are we as Buddhists going to be, you know, when the apocalypse comes, right? When the water has run out, when the fuel has run out, when the zombies are attacking, how are you going to be then? Where are your precepts going to be then at the end of the world will it be okay for you to steal food to feed your, to feed your family is it okay to kill someone who is trying to steal your food food is it okay to kill zombies yes it is because they're already dead right is it okay at the end to, to maybe take another partner so you have a chance to procreate or something? So anyway, this is just kind of like wacky thought games. But the point being, at that time, that's when your precepts will be tested, right? But our precepts are being tested all the time. We don't need to wait for the apocalypse to find that we need to really think about how we're living our life. And, the, you know, there's wars going on all around us. Imagine being in the Ukraine now and having to make these decisions about stealing food, stealing fuel, cutting down someone's tree so that you could be warm. Like, how would you, you know, can we judge them? What would you do? And in the same way, in our, in our work or in our personal lives, we're going to have these kind of problems come up all the time. And that's when it matters. That's when we have to, to, to really reflect upon what we're doing. So what is, the, what is the purpose for all of these precepts, rules, ethical dilemmas, systems of ethics? What is the purpose? Do you think? Why, why, do they, why do they exist? Why is it a thing, even, in Buddhism? Why do we have these precepts outlined by the Buddha? Why? Any ideas? As a guide, yep. A guide to what? Yeah, livelihood, yeah. Towards liberation. What else? Why do we have these things? Have you ever asked yourself that before? Why are there precepts? Become a better person. To be conscious. To be conscious, yeah, what's going on, right? Conscious. Yeah, conscience, yes. What else? Anything else? That's right. So many of these actions, such as killing, stealing, are associated with rebirth in the lower realms. So do you do these do you do these precepts out of fear? 
or wisdom <laughs> or a combination. So there's, there's, there's many reasons, right, so why we keep these precepts. So one is to prevent us from becoming heedless. And that heedlessness, of course, will lead to bad consequences for us. And another is to prevent harm to others and to ourself. There's also, true, some fear about the consequences of our actions, let alone in the future, um, rebirth. What about this life? Getting caught by the cops, getting punished. And the Buddha lists in the Bala Pandita Sutta all these punishments that they used to do to, people, to criminals at the time of the Buddha, and they weren't nice. They were pretty horrible, and we'd call them torture today. And so, you know, people had a real fear of doing bad because they would be punished. Even in our culture, you know, going to prison is not a holiday camp. So we have this fear um, from being punished in this life, let alone, uh, you know, in the same sort of the Buddha talks about the kind of punishments you might experience in hell, which is like getting impaled repeatedly by hot rods of um, metal or getting molten metal poured down your throat over and over again, things like this. And so that's all, all some reasons why these precepts um, might be there for us and why we might keep them. But in our, in our daily practice, as Lily pointed out, the, the reason is so that we feel good about ourself, that we feel okay about our actions, that we don't feel bad, guilty, blameful, so that we don't have any regrets. Having regrets is pretty bad about our actions because that's the kind of stuff when you come to sit down and meditate that just reverberate around your mind, yeah? Oh, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't said that thing. Even from years and years and years ago, sometimes these memories come back and haunt your mind, echo in your mind, and it feels icky, feels uncomfortable, feels unpleasurable. And there's a relationship between our ethical conduct and our ability to make progress on the path. So one of my favourite suttas, which I'll just go through very quickly, is the, the simile of the farmer in the field. And the farmer has three urgent duties. Three urgent duties. First duty is to prepare the field. You have to prepare the soil, right? You have to take out all the stones, all the weeds. Otherwise, whatever you plant there can't grow properly because there's stones and other things in the way or the weeds will choke it out. So preparing the soil is the first urgent duty. It's the most important duty. Otherwise, whatever's planted there can't flourish. The second urgent duty is to plant the seed. Right? You prepare the soil, plant the seed. So you prepare the soil, the seed has the best chance to flourish. That seed needs good conditions in order for it to grow. And then the third urgent duty is to irrigate that field at the right time with the right amount of water. If you don't irrigate it, that seed can't grow. And the Buddha said, even when the farmer has done these three urgent duties, they can't force that crop to rise up and ripen. They can't force it to fruit. 
All they can do is put the causes and the conditions in place so that when it's ripe, it'll be ripe of its own accord. We can't force it to happen. It'll flower and fruit according to its own causes and conditions. In the same way, we have three urgent duties. We need to prepare our field, that is, our ethical conduct. So sila is the field. Adi sila sika, the training in higher ethics. This is the field where our practice needs to be thoroughly cleansed of rocks and weeds so that the seed can grow. That seed is the mind. Adichitta sika. This is meditation, mental development. That seed of meditation can only flourish when the ground has been carefully prepared. Otherwise, we can meditate, 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 but we'll never get any results. And this is unfortunately how many people come to meditation in the West. Sorry, many people come to spiritual practice in the West. They'll come in at the point of meditation through Vipassana or through mindfulness or something like that. But they will never hear about ethics. And so their meditation is always limited. The better prepared your field of ethics is, the deeper your meditation, the stronger your meditation will be. Is it possible? It's a little bit stuffy in here. Is it possible to maybe to pump the aircon a little bit just to... I see everyone sweating a bit and looking a bit um, uncomfortable. And then the irrigation is wisdom. So that seed needs to be constantly watered with wisdom. And this means listening to the teaching. This is uh, adipanya sikha. This is understanding the nature of cause and effect. This is seeing for yourself the way things truly are. Listening to good teachers who have had experience of walking the meditation path, understanding the nature of reality, the nature of experience. And these teachers help us understand. These teachers help us develop our own wisdom. They rain on us. They irrigate our meditation, and then our seed can grow. So, in the same way that that farmer couldn't force that crop to flourish, we can't force our meditation or our spiritual practice to flourish either. It happens when it's ready to happen. We can't force ourself to become enlightened, it will happen when the causes and conditions allow for that seed to ripen, for that plant to fruit. Only then will it happen. In the same way, we can't even demand joy in our meditation practice. It will happen when the causes and conditions allow for that to occur. And so this is, this is the importance of sila. There was, I, I do want to talk about one other really important thing, but I'm, I'm just seeing everyone's looking a bit sweaty and maybe we need a little stretch, <laughs> a little break and to refresh so that um, we can hear this 
last important thing. So can we just take five minutes and we'll come back and uh, we'll be a bit refreshed. Yeah.